Should be live. Let's give a moment. Let's see. Is OBS going to play nice today? I updated it. It is. All right. Uh, so, uh, last I checked, today is August 27th, 2024. Uh, you are here for CSE 466, uh, Computer Systems Security. Uh, this lecture is going to be a little bit of a repeat of Thursday. I'm going to try and speed run it so that we can get into uh, something a bit more fun. Uh, my name is Robert Wassinger. Uh, I'm going to be your instructor. Uh, a little bit about me, my background. Uh, I'm a PhD student. I work in the CEPCOMP lab, that's ASU's cybersecurity lab. Uh, we do a lot of interesting things, typically focused around uh, binary exploitation or cybersecurity more broad as well. Uh, if you are interested in cybersecurity research, uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'll try and connect you to the right people uh, and go from there. If you are in this room, there's kind of a general assumption as far as what you know. Uh, most of these things should have been taught in CSE 365. Uh, who here has not taken CSE 365? Okay, no, it's, it's fine. I got I think I like a handful. Yeah, cool. No, I just want to have an idea so that I, I uh, present information at the appropriate level for everyone. Uh, so if you haven't, uh, the things that are taught there, it's kind of an intro to cybersecurity course, touches on a bunch of different things, uh, networking, crypto, uh, binary exploitation, reverse engineering. This class is going to build off of kind of the Linux binary exploitation uh, concepts that were taught in that class. So the loose expectations here is that you are somewhat proficient in uh, Linux tools. You're not scared of the terminal uh, to some degree. Like you can at least do some basic commands there. You don't have to be a Vim wizard, but you can function in the terminal. Similarly, I uh, have some familiarity with some common reverse engineering tools. So know how to use GDB, know how to use, for instance, Ida, Ghidra, Binary Ninja, any of those, take your pick. I don't really care uh, as long as you have one of those tools and know how to use them. You're not scared of x86 assembly. Uh, this course is going to share pretty much zero source code. So every challenge, every assignment, everything that we do uh, is going to be, here's a raw binary, reverse it, figure it out. Uh, that means that you have to use these tools to then interpret the assembly to just like get started. That's why that is an expectation. And this can't be stated enough. Be comfortable and knowledgeable in like how to figure things out. Right? Do you know how to research Linux syscalls or look up what a libc function does? This isn't just Google it. Uh, the default answer here is kind of read the man page. Right? If you know what a man page is, that's a good thing. If you ask a question where the answer is in a man page, I'll probably tell you, man, whatever, and go figure it out. All right. Uh, it's not to be rude. We're actually trying to teach a particular set of skills here. Uh, and one of them is generally being self-sufficient. <laughs> Cool. Uh, with that said, uh, this is like the sixth or seventh iteration of this course. This is a very difficult course. Uh, I took it in the very first iteration in my undergrad. It's like six or seven years ago. And the drop rate then was like 60% uh, by the end of the semester. This isn't meant to terrify you. I'm not telling you to drop the class. Uh, I'm just telling you that this is going to be a lot of work. There's going to be a lot of material thrown at you at a very rapid pace, and there's going to be a ton of hours put in to follow the pace that this course is going to go. All right, I'm totally willing to help people learn, spend a lot of time answering questions, uh, interact with you here in class, etc. But even if I spent every day helping everyone, it'd still be a lot of work for all of you. So if you are taking other demanding courses, I would recommend that you consider which one you enjoy more. Uh, because taking this in line with another demanding course is not a optimal strategy. Uh, especially since this is a 400 level course, you're all probably wrapping up your undergrad. You know, you want to get your degree and get out. If you're just trying to take a class, all right, sign it, check out, get the degree. 
this isn't the room for you. Right? This is not going to be a, a cruise through course. All right, so if you do have any doubts, please consider uh, fixing your schedule. Uh, historically, about half of students that sign up pass it. That isn't half of students that stick it stick through. It's day one, there's, I don't know, 160 or so students. Roughly 80 of those will drop or not pass the class. Drop, withdraw, or not pass. That, that is part of the course on average across all like six or seven iterations. Just so you know what you're getting into. All right, so if it's really hard and it's brutal and I'm going to like run everyone ragged, why the heck would anyone take this course? Uh, well, if you are interested in cybersecurity at all, this is the course to take. If you aren't interested in cybersecurity at all, but you want to understand how computers actually work, this is the course to take. Now, I said in the prereqs here that you need to know how to use a debugger, this can be DDP, some static disassembly, uh, understand how assembly works. The skills that you learn in this course, while we may use them for exploitation, are infinitely powerful for you as a general purpose computer science programmer, no matter what it is that you go into, to reason about how programs behave, how they work, why things don't work the way you think they should. So even if you have zero interest in binary exploitation or cybersecurity, you can still gain a ton from this class. We also will bribe people with shiny things. Uh, so if you're not familiar, this course runs in a platform uh, called Pwn College. And one of the things that we do at Pwn College is we reward people that complete all of the material, not necessarily all of the class, uh, but all of the material on the site uh, with belts kind of in acknowledgement of their accomplishment because it is so hard. Okay. Uh, last, like, I don't know, last month, whenever DEF CON was, uh, we had the opportunity here uh, to get on stage and those that were at DEF CON that had completed all of the material, uh, we actually awarded belts to them live on the DEF CON stage. Uh, one of the people up there is actually the Dark Tangent, uh, who's the founder of DEF CON. Uh, which is pretty cool. So you, you could get a belt awarded to you by the founder of DEF CON uh, if you really push yourself and complete this material. We also have shiny coins, uh, which we'll get into. So how does this class actually work? Uh, this class is a flipped classroom. What does that mean? There's lots of classes that say, hey, this is a flipped classroom. We're going to use Canvas or blah, 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 blah. What does it mean here? Generally speaking, and this goes to a question that I got uh, before class started here, before the stream started, Modules will be released on a Friday. This is Friday before class. But there's no class on Friday, so it'll be it'll be sometime around uh, like six o'clock, give or take, uh, on Friday. A module will consist of several pre-recorded lecture videos. Uh, they may be uh, by a prior instructor or by myself. I'm going to attempt uh, to record fresh uh, takes on all of the content uh, as we move forward. It'll be hit or miss depending upon what I get to. Uh, kind of given the pace and how the class is doing. Uh, along with those videos, there's a series of increasing difficulty challenges. Uh, each of these are challenge binaries to exploit. In general, my target is about 30 challenges per module to give you an idea of what I'm shooting for. And I said these are released on Friday. Why Friday? We have class Tuesday and Thursday. The idea is you will watch these videos over that weekend. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, watch some of it. Right? Maybe it's two hours of content, watch an hour of it. You don't have to watch all of it. I don't expect to know everything. Okay? But watch some of it and start working on the challenges. Just fire up the first one, mess around with it. If you get it, great, go to the next one. If you don't, okay, you're stuck. You show up on Tuesday, you show up on Thursday. I want to know what you're stuck on. I don't want to hear, I'm stuck on level two. I want to hear, I'm working on this. This is what I'm seeing. I don't understand what's going on. Class will be me answering your questions. It will not be what we have right here today with me and a bunch of slides. The slide deck you'll get every class after this one will be somewhere between five and seven slides. The slides will mostly consist of your memes. Uh, and then there will be a slide that says, here's what I plan on demoing unless you hit me with a question. All of class is going to be live demos. Sometimes I'll do things and they'll work. Sometimes I'll do things and they'll blow up. They will truly be live demos. I don't know what I'm going to do until you hit me with it. Part of the fun is what makes this class fun for me. I like engagement. It's what makes this whole thing work. Asking questions early uh, on our class Discord helps me know what you're likely to hit me with, which means I can come with canned demos so we spend more time playing around with things instead of me writing up examples. So if there is something that you're stuck on, 
the earlier you hit me with it, the smoother it'll be in class when we get to talk about that particular concept. All right. Uh, so there is a Thursday and Tuesday class. This is the Tuesday class. Both of them are listed as hybrid courses. That means there is an online component and there is an in-person component. After today, I am treating both sections as the exact same class. You're getting the same lecture that I hit everyone with on Tuesday. That's because I think that it's totally reasonable for a student to show up on their first day of the section that's assigned to them, right? So nothing's been assigned. We'll all be on the same page at the end of class today. Treat you all as the same. You are welcome to attend both lectures uh, in person, assuming that there aren't capacity issues and the fire marshal becomes an issue. Uh, alternatively, you can watch both lectures. So this is being streamed live on Twitch. Uh, the VODs are immediately available, unless for some reason I have to pull it down. And within a day or two, I upload them to YouTube. So you should have ready access to them. Content between these two classes or these two sections will not be repeated aside from Thursday and today. As I said, they're streamed on Twitch. Uh, they're also available on YouTube, twitch.tv slash college and youtube.com slash college. Attendance, we're all grownups. It is not mandatory to show up to this room. However, it is highly encouraged and appreciated. I try and be an engaging instructor, make this fun for everyone because it is brutal. Uh, the more of you that are here, uh, the more fun it is for me and the more I can kind of uh, be engaging and hopefully uh, answer your questions in real time. It's a lot harder when all the questions are coming to me on Twitch and I have to kind of jump back and forth. There are no exams. Everything that you do uh, will be one of these modules that are released. Uh, the stated plan is there will be 10 modules throughout the course. As I said, each module will be a series of challenges. The course grade will be calculated as an average of these module grades. Uh, Real-time grading is available on Pwn.College uh, on the website, which we should have time to get to as long as I keep on cooking. The plan here for what is this semester going to look like? This is tentative. However, I am going to try and stick to it uh, quite rigidly. Is as follows. Today is 827. Uh, at the end of class at 6 o'clock today, a program security module is going to be released on the course dojo. It's already set up. It's going live. I don't have to do anything. I could drop right now and it will be up. Uh, that's going to be due seven days from now, or six days from now, I guess. Uh, midnight on 9-2, which is the Monday preceding Tuesday's class. Uh, these first two modules are going to be a little bit wonky as far as scheduling goes. Question. Yeah, I do have one question on the, uh, the due date. Yes. Uh, I know they say 9 9 16, 9 30, 10 14, so on so forth. So here's my question. This is something that I want to clarify. I think a lot of people will probably have this question. When you say a specific date, for example, the second the second of September or the sixteenth of September, does that mean midnight on the second of September? Does that mean midnight on the third of September? Okay. So the the question is I, I'm giving you a date, what does this all mean? Time is tricky, um, et cetera. Right? And I said midnight, and I get that midnight is kind of a misnomer here. Uh, so uh, this is not live right now, but this is what you will see uh, in roughly an hour from now. Uh, you see that there is a checkpoint uh, deadline. There is a due deadline. This counts down as you refresh the page. So there should be no questions about when a deadline is. Uh, additionally, if for whatever reason you want to see your grade, uh, when you're on the course dojo here, we can click on this little course icon. You don't get an admin icon, I'm sorry. Uh, but here is our syllabus on the left hand side. It does say grades if we click on that okay, uh, So there's 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 the deadline I was asking about. So it's 1159 it, it turns out that this timestamp and that countdown reference the exact same like microsecond. No, it's right. it's mind-blowing what computers can do right. no, I understand. <laughs> uh, right? I understand that. Uh, but, but yes, so when I say midnight it is 1159 59 Arizona time Because <laughs> midnight means usually Depending on this is what I mean when I say midnight. Okay, if you would like, I can state 11.59.59 p.m. No need. On 9.2. Because I, uh, I, I, I don't want there to be confusion, but I, I, th I think we surface it um, quite clearly in a couple of different places. You said there's 30 challenges per module and then 10 modules? Uh, yes. So rub, rub, 300. Rub, roughly 300 challenges over the course of the semester, increasing in difficulty. Uh, now, now, 
the first half of this is kind of the scary pitch, and then we, we get to a little bit of, hey, you know, let's let's bring it all in. So so let's finish the slide deck before before we bail. <laughs> Although if you bail, I totally understand, right? It's it's a reasonable uh, reasonable thought, and I wouldn't fault anyone uh, for having that thought. Uh, so this first one is six days. This is a tight timeline. I recognize that. That's what I'm going to shoot for uh, because I want to make sure that we get to the later content. All topics we, we intend on covering. Advanced reverse engineering. If you took CSE 365, you did a reverse engineering module. I'm not repeating that. This is why I put the word advanced in front of it because we're going to do some fancy stuff they definitely didn't do in 365. Uh, we're then going to jump into ROP, which is Return Oriented Programming. We're going to do a little bit of heap exploitation. Uh, we're going to do a program exploitation module. I realize that the naming is similar to program security that's launching tonight. It is not the same thing. Uh, this is going to be similar to a midterm in the sense that it is a comprehensive set of challenges that encompasses all of the prior topics. Uh, to kind of give you an idea, so this is the, the scary boss one. Uh, then, once we come back from spring break, uh, we will start off with uh, kernel security, uh, race conditions, sandbox escapes, microarchitecture exploitation, uh, which is a super cool thing. I'm very excited to bring this down to the CSE 466. Uh, if you have, you, who has heard of Spectre or Meltdown? A few people. All right, cool. So that'll be very fun. Uh, for those that do know, uh, what we'll be doing in that module is writing both a Spectre and Meltdown exploit from scratch that runs on the actual hardware that backs the entire site. It, it's it's going to be fantastic, right? This is my third time uh, teaching this particular talk, and it's always a blast for me. Uh, <laughs> then we have system exploitation, and uh, that is kind of like our final exam where everything that is on here is fair game. Uh, one thing worth noting, system exploitation is due on 12.16. And I list here finals. Finals are done on 12.14. How am I making something due after finals? My general strategy here is my deadline to submit stuff is I think 12.16 or 12.17. And so I will let you work on stuff until I have to ship it to ASU. I need about 12 hours to pull the grades, take a look at it, make sure nothing looks you know, utterly ridiculous uh, and post it to ASU. Another thing that's worth noting is these four modules here in bold are running for one week. In general, uh, the modules are going to run for two weeks where they release on a Friday, you have 14 days plus a weekend. So everything here is 17 days. And the bold ones, someone did the math for me, I think are 10, uh, except for this first one here, which runs for six. Uh, the bold ones, aside from this first one, uh, are much easier topics to just cover in general. Question. So you have the program security and then it's knowledge check. Is that the same one or is that two different modules? Uh, so, oh, um, that's on me. Okay. So, uh, no, that's fair. Good question. All right, so at one point uh, when I was putting this together, it was called the knowledge track. Uh, then I decided that was kind of a lame name uh, because, you know, knowledge check just doesn't have the, the pizzazz, you know, of program security. Uh, and knowledge check would assume we kind of imply that these are things that you already learned in 365. Uh, it is not going to be the exact same things that you learned in 365. It's going to immediately build off of it. So I'm assuming that the binary exploitation module that you did in 365, you have a good grasp of what's going on or else we're riding the struggle bus for the next week. Okay, so I said the course grade is an average of the module grades. Uh, how do the how are these modules actually graded? Uh, well, in a simple world, it would just be whatever the percentage of the completion is. But over the years, we've learned that isn't the best way of doing this. So a module is graded as two components. First, eighty percent of the module grade is just the percentage of challenges solved. Say there's ten challenges, you solve five of them, you get fifty percent. That applies to this portion up here. The second portion here, second portion here says early bird checkpoint. This early bird checkpoint is a date that is listed on the grades page and also on the module page, as you saw with the countdown. It is a deadline where your task is to complete half of the challenges by the listed date. It's an all or nothing. Why do we have this? This is a hard demanding course that's going to run you ragged. It turns out students don't believe me when I say that. And what happens is students will wait until the very last day, two days, three days before, and then try and solve everything and not do well. Uh, because they don't realize how difficult the ramp of any given module is. The intention is for the first half to be pretty easy. Uh, the second quarter 
uh, to be reasonably solved by an average student and the last quarter to honestly maybe not get solved by the average student in this class. Okay. Uh, so a way of biasing that in the favor of the average student is having this checkpoint. If you start early, complete half of the challenges by whatever the deadline for the checkpoint is, you just get a 20%, 20 percent, 20 percent of that module. This biases in favor of people who start early and get the first half done. Most modules are live for 17 days. Uh, all challenges can be solved late for 50% credit until the end of the semester. And that automatically shows up on the Palm College website. It does the math for you. Now, we do offer a reasonable amount of extra credit here. 8% uh, of the course grade is on the table uh, for extra credit for making memes. For 16 weeks in a course, post one meme per week. That is liked by the Sense AI Pwn College bot. It'll have a little green icon in our memes channel. You'll get 0.5% extra credit. The bot will like anything that an instructor indicates to like. Not just me, you're not placating me. Any instructor that is on the Pwn College website. So it could be uh, Jan, Connor, someone teaching 365. It could be somebody teaching another course just as long as it's running on the Pwn College platform uh, this semester. Uh, ideally, these memes are related to course content, a challenge that was hard, something that you learned, something that sucked, uh, something that I did that was ridiculous, something relevant to the course. My general bar is quite low as far as what I will like on a meme because I want you to get the extra credit because I know it's a hard course. So if you put forth a little bit of effort to post a meme, I'll put a little bit of effort to try and like it and give you the 0.5% extra credit. You can also get 5% extra credit from helping, uh, that says, or asking good questions, which is a lie, uh, just by helping other people. Uh, so our Discord does have a system of thanking uh, people. So if somebody asks a question, you answer it, they find it helpful, they can thank you on the Discord. Uh, you do that by applying the little green arrow uh, emoji to a message, or by right-clicking, selecting apps, and then thanks, and the bot will apply the thanks for you. It's a logarithmic scale capping at 50 instances. So if you said 50 helpful things on the Discord, based upon the discretion of your peers, uh, you would get 5% extra credit. Uh, for those that don't know what a logarithmic scale means, uh, that means that the earlier help is worth more points than the later help. The motivation here is to try and get everybody to engage and interact on the Discord. I'm looking for real interaction. Please don't try and game the system by like thanking each other doing silly things like that, uh, we can track it, don't have to take it away, and that's a shame because you kind of need the extra credit in this course. So in total, you can get 13% extra credit uh, via memes and helping people. What does that all break down to as far as a grade? I, I find this to be a great slide because at face value, it sounds a little bit confusing. So let's say that you did 49% of every module. Well, that's less than 50, and that checkpoint there is really going to hurt you because that's 20% of the course grade functionally. So if you did 49% of every module, you would walk out of here with a 39.2, you would not pass the class. Now, hypothetically, uh, what if you did 50%? Uh, so you just did a little bit more and you did it by that checkpoint, right? So you did it early instead of waiting until the last minute. All of a sudden that 20% checkpoint credit swings in your favor. Now you're getting 60% D, right? You still didn't pass the class, but that's a pretty strong 20% swing. Now, what if you did 50% of every module, com completing it a half by the checkpoint, and you did that 13% extra credit? Cool, you get a 73, you pass the class, you get a C, life goes on, you can walk out of here, get your diploma, everybody wins. So if you're trying to pass this class, post a lot of memes, say some helpful things, do half of the material by the checkpoint deadline. I don't think that's a, a unrealistic ask. So what if I did 75% of the modules? I'd get an 80% B. That, that checkpoint credit is still working in your favor. If I want to get an A, you can do 75% of the modules, meme it up, help some people, you'll get a 93% A, great. And you only did three quarters of every module. So when I say like the last quarter is meant to be challenging, the grading system has that in mind here, all right? 
The key is, is that you participate, you mean you, you take advantage of what is being offered here to kind of compensate and balance the scales in your favor. To get an A+, plus, you don't even have to do everything. 84% uh, of every module by the checkpoint, uh, along with that extra credit. Has anyone ever done 100%? Yes. Uh, several students do um, every iteration. Uh, completing 100%, not necessarily the course material, uh, but the belt material, which the course will loosely follow, uh, will result in earning a Pone College belt, uh, which we make a... Uh, we have a belting ceremony and we, we stream it. Uh, it's, it's actually quite a thing. So like um, Pone College belts have been awarded for like six years. I think oh, this is not just at ASU, but online to the world. I want to say there's only like 200 and something uh, over the, the six years that, that have completed all of the material on the site. Uh, this class loosely follows the yellow belt and green belt material. Um, I also teach the blue belt material, which, which follows after this. Uh, but blue belts, it's like 200 and something. Uh, over like six years. Uh, it, it actually is quite uh, quite the high bar uh, worldwide. So how do you succeed in this course? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, walk through lecture videos when they are released and start early. You'll notice that's kind of a repeating theme here. Uh, ask questions to confirm your understanding. Like if you are confused, ask in the Discord, right? Get it out there, get it sorted out early. Don't spend a lot of time banging your head against the wall. Although, Depending on what you ask, we may tell you to just bang your head against the wall. But we'll, we'll try to not make that the case. Uh, ask good questions. Uh, back in the day, I used to shoot these two links out on the Discord pretty regularly. Not to be mean, but they were taken that way. I'm going to start shooting them out again uh, this semester, and I want to make sure people understand that this is not to be mean. Has anyone seen either of these two links? Yes. Okay. Well, I've seen it because I was here. Well, you know, that counts. That counts. I'll, I'll give it. Um, they're, they're very common uh, in technical, technical areas. Uh, the first one is entitled, uh, How to Ask Questions the Smart Way. Uh, it is a giant read, and it has a disclaimer that in general on the internet, people that work in high technical fields uh, will frequently link people uh, to this. Uh, it explains how to ask a good technical question. The expectation when you are asking things on the Discord is that you articulate your problem reasonably well. This means if I'm stuck on level two of, I don't know, shell coding, don't say uh, level two shell coding, it's seg faults, I don't know why. That, that isn't enough information for me to articulate a good response. This is a great read. I'm not going to like mandate anyone reads it. Uh, but if you want to get better at communicating with technical people, highly recommend uh, reading that. It gives you a lot of great advice about how to frame your question, how to word it, what kind of information um, is pertinent and what is not. Uh, the other thing that you may get linked to over the course of this semester is don't ask to ask, which is another thing uh, that frequently floats around technical uh, kind of groups. There are thousands of people who know stuff on the Discord. Asking the question like, does anyone know X is a waste of time. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of whoever's trying to answer your question's time. Most of the time, people answering questions on the Discord are not just chilling in front of their computer. Right? We do other things, not just myself, but other like blue belts and knowledgeable people on the Discord in general that will certainly try and help people. If I pick up my phone and I see, hey, somebody asked a question on the Discord, if you wrote something that's well written, I understand what your problem is, and I'm just walking from somewhere on campus to somewhere else on campus. I can respond right there on my phone. You'll get a quick response. If you say, does anyone know about level two of binary exploitation? I have no idea what you're asking about. As somebody pointed out, there's gonna be about 300 challenges this semester. Level two of binary exploitation means nothing to me. It may mean something to you. I have to look at it and work at it from first concepts. What is the actual technical problem you're facing? So. Please keep that in mind when you're working on the Discord. If you get hit with either of these links, don't take offense by it. We're trying to help you uh, improve in technical communication. That, that is actually the objective. Yes? Um, what, when you're asking questions for people, what, what's like the level of like safety in regards to sharing information about a problem? Like oh. making sure you don't overshare and you know, for academic integrity stuff. Sure. Uh, so the, the question for Twitch was, A, I just said, ask good questions, provide technical detail. We're also at a university. I'm going to get in trouble for academic integrity if I do what Robert just said, right? Uh, this is a double-edged sword, and, and it's, it's going to be brutal. 
I get where you're coming from. Uh, fortunately uh, for you, the person who gets you in trouble with academic integrity is me. Uh, so use your best judgment. I will assume good intentions if you overstep. I'll message you, I'll delete the message, right? The assumption is, is that you're trying uh, to ask a good question. And if you overstep, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Uh, I don't have a slide on it, but I should after what 365 did yesterday. Uh, cheating. Don't cheat, okay? The cloud is somebody else's server. In this case, Pwn College is our server. We own it. We see what you're doing. Don't be dumb, okay? I don't want to bust people for academic integrity. Please don't make me. Like that's that's kind of my, my general feel on it, right? I, I want people to learn. I want people to communicate. I assume good intent. Don't abuse my, my generosity. You'd get many, many a message before it, it escalates to any degree like that, yes. okay? Um, the, the goal is to improve understanding, not to uh, flog people. Okay. Uh, so participate in the course, as hopefully the math shows, extra credit adds up. Meme early, meme often. And once again, start early. The entire course is set up to try and get people to do that. And every semester, there are people who do not. All right, so I am your instructor for the course. Uh, again, my name is Robert Walsinger. On the Discord, my handle is Rob Waz. I am a giant screaming Bill Nye head hurtling through space. Uh, if you took, I, I just vibe with it, it's not a Bill Nye thing. Uh, if you took 365, there's pretty good odds that at some point you saw me or dealt with me on, on the Discord, so you have some idea of how I function. Uh, if for, that is the primary means to communicate with me. In general, I try not to do DMs, but if for whatever reason you feel it's it's mission critical that this is a, a private communication, you, you can DM me, it's open, you don't have to try and be my friend, just hit me. Uh, and if there is for whatever reason some official communication that needs to go via email, uh, you can email me. Uh, my email is rwasinger at asu.edu. Office hours, uh, I've listed as TBD. There's a reason for that on the next slide. So we'll get back to that. There are three graduate level TAs uh, that assist me in this course. Uh, they all have not only completed this class, uh, but have definitely done a good amount of the blue belt material, which is the course that follows this. So they definitely know their stuff. This class is Tuesday and Thursday, 4.30 to 5.45. Their office hours are Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 4.30 to 5.20. So it's kind of the exact same intersection here. Uh, so you could get an answer to a question any day of the week. That is by design. Now, these office hours are in BYENG 209. Uh, we are doing something a little bit different this semester. We are doing what I'm loosely referring to as the Pwn College Hour of Power. Uh, and, and what that means uh, is the people in BYENG 209 uh, at that time slot are not just one TA. Uh, this is going to have uh, 365 TAs, 365 graduate TAs. It's going to have these dedicated TAs for this class and possibly TAs for a graduate level class. I haven't uh, pinned down the logistics there, but it's gonna be a pretty happening space. Uh, we do have overflow rooms. The idea here is we get as many people that know things together in one room and hopefully people can get what they need in a reasonable time. So if you'd say, hey, I wrote this and I want someone to kind of shadow surf me and help me fix my code, uh, their direct instruction is to not write your code for you, so just know that going into it. Uh, but if you're like, hey, I really need some one-on-one, -on -one, this is the way to get it. Now, one of the comments I got um, on Thursday was, hey, this is all in the evening. And it turns out most uh, hackers I know are not morning people, uh, including myself, uh, which is why you happen to see this type of scheduling. So. Are there people who are interested in earlier help, earlier in the day? Is that important to people? Like, do you have value? Because I, I'm living here at TBB. So, so potentially I could hold some type of uh, in-person office hours earlier in the day if there are people who like the sun. Well, we got, we got some, yeah, all right, whatever. All right, I like this section. <laughs> all right, uh, th Thursday section uh, had a preference for mornings. I still, I still might try and accommodate them because it seems like everyone here is kind of, eh, all right, whatever. Uh, so this TBD tentatively, and I'll announce on the Discord once I get it locked in because I have to reserve a room. Uh, what I'm thinking I'm gonna do is I'm gonna shoot for noon 
on Friday. I'll, I'll reserve a room. Uh, you can come if you want to talk with me specifically and not the TAs. That's totally fine. I uh, will do it for, we'll schedule it for an hour. Typically my office hours run for two. Um, and I will try and stream them because that was requested. So it'll be kind of a part of it we stream, part of it won't. You'll play it by ear. It's going to be a similar experience to the classroom, but in a smaller setting. Hopefully I'm dealing with more direct questions in a smaller setting. Question. Yeah, I wanted to nail this down. You mentioned that uh, this class is slated on Tuesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. When I signed up for it, just mentioned Tuesday, and that's a that's okay because it says like hybrid, I mm -hmm. think. So, uh, so you're not going to be repeating the same material from like a Tuesday on a Thursday class. You're Correct. It'll be like different material. Is that right? Correct. So the the question for Twitch uh, was, hey, I signed up for a Tuesday class. It's listed as hybrid. You're saying you're doing different things Tuesday, Thursday. What's going on here? Uh, and the the answer is uh, somewhere up here uh, that these are these are two sections. It's listed for the Tuesday people as a hybrid course. It's listed for the Thursday people as a hybrid course. In theory, what happens is you show up in person to the section that you signed up for, and then you watch the stream of the opposite section. All right, uh, and they will be doing the inverse. That way, we can still move content, move through content at a rapid pace. We satisfy this hybrid criteria because you have an in-person and an online component. Uh, and we get to answer a variety of questions and cover a different amount of content. Class time, ideally, will not be me lecturing, right? Like when, uh, when I say there will be different content in Tuesday and Thursday, that will be, I don't know, people ask questions about this, this, and this, and I'll write them down. Tuesday, I'll knock out the first two. Thursday, I'll talk about the third one, right? What I talk about up here is dynamically based upon what you guys get stuck on, what you explode on, what I think is immediately relevant to what you're dealing with, right? And that's why it's, it's different on each day, okay. right? Uh, and again, uh, it's not this slide, but attendance to either section. I don't care if you show up. I would appreciate it because I like being able to look at you and be like, all right, you know, just to see, see getting what I'm putting down, right? Uh, because on Twitch, it's a little hard to know. Uh, so you don't have to show up, uh, and if you want to show up to both, have at it, right? Uh, but good, good question. All right, where am I here? So yeah, so we have these three TAs. Uh, this overlaps with the 365 recitation. Showing up to this is entirely optional. Again, showing up to class is optional. Please do, because it makes it more fun for me. Uh, if you need help, hopefully there's enough manpower to get it done. Uh, there may be more than one of the 466 TAs here, but these are the slots that they are mandated to kind of man or staff. You guys didn't ask this one. Uh, this is my favorite slide on this entire deck. Uh, Pwn College 2024 changes. Uh, so I will, I'm just telling you straight up, uh, be adding and changing challenges. I will be adding and changing video content. Uh, things will be changed up from whatever it is that happened last semester and the semester before. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, now, I, it's somewhat obvious from the schedule here because we're talking about very different topics uh, than the previous iterations have. And it is worth noting that on the general Pwn College Dojo, I look at system security. Hey, look, there is a sandboxing module. There's a race conditions module. There's something on kernel exploitation or kernel security, right? Is this literally what I'm going to be throwing at you? The answer is wait and see. All right. Uh, if you want to work ahead for whatever reason, you're welcome to do these challenges. There's no guarantee that I will use them or not use them. Uh, if you solve anything ahead and I happen to use it, you do get credit. All right. So there is that. Uh, but you don't know uh, until it goes live. And for a large part, I don't know because I'm building the tracks that the train is moving on as the class progresses. I have some idea of where we're going, but it doesn't exist. Uh, in some cases. Uh, the common question is exactly that. Hey, can I solve everything in your class before I take it and just get a free ride? This is the exact same copy pasta I have been delivering for several years. And it is, it is always nice to see that people are individually interested in the site's content. Please keep in mind that there is no guarantee that any existing module or module content will be used in a given class iteration. Instructors reserve the right to exclude, modify, and add content every course iteration. Nothing is formally assigned as part of an ASU course until the ASU course instructor assigns it. 
And to be clear, the fact that I showed you a tentative schedule does not mean that I'm assigning anything. That is just what we're going to try and move at. So you're free to work ahead. You have no guarantee. Do so at your own risk. Oh, I made a second one that included somebody's meme I like. Where they, were, they worked ahead and they didn't appreciate me. Yeah. So, so sometimes it's like that, guys. Uh, a few other comments on this particular iteration. This is a repeat from uh, kind of when I taught the graduate level class in the spring, but I think it's still worth repeating because it applies here as well. Uh, there are previous iterations of this class. Uh, we used to have their office hours and classes streamed on YouTube and on Twitch. They are no longer there. They haven't been there for most of the year. Hopefully that isn't a surprise to anyone. So if you were banking on relying on ancient videos, those aren't there. Uh, similarly, on um, Thursday it wasn't the case, but I believe it's the case now, maybe not. Um, historical Discord chats. Uh, as of this semester... The answer to the question of whether it is the case now or not is no. It is still there. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that there's there's something that uh, is being worked on there as far as how we want to deal with forums, uh, which is why I believe the old content is still there. Uh, but sometime in the next week, I would certainly expect uh, the prior chats will go away. So you can't just like search the Discord for somebody that six months ago was like, hey, you know, and they were helpful, maybe a little bit too helpful, but we let it slide, right? Uh, the idea here is to force everyone to actually talk about the content, mess around with it, Learn by doing and interacting, uh, not by finding some random message from the ancient wizard on the Discord. Uh, it's also worth noting that as of 2024 in general, uh, the instructors for the official kind of Pwn College core classes here have all like loosely agreed that we will not be streaming the literal challenges that you solve. Uh, I saw on, on topic, somebody asked if we're gonna jump into solving challenges. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, if I have it my way, I will solve absolutely zero challenges that are assigned to you. This is why it's important that you express what you're stuck on, because I have to create a proxy example on the fly to demonstrate the concept. Uh, it turns out if I solve or work on the problems that you do, uh, what happens is you students historically will pause the video at a strategic timestamp and then just type whatever I happen to put on the screen. Uh, that's unfortunate because then you get to a challenge that we did not demo and you know nothing. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a form of self-sabotage. So I'm going to focus on concepts, not level two, level three. So the program security module, I alluded to it, launches at six o'clock, so about 40 minutes from now. It is due Monday at midnight. Midnight is 11.59.59 p.m. Arizona time on 9.2. Don't panic. I know it's a close, say, six-day timeline. My general take on kind of modules, grades, somewhere in here, somewhere in grading, I think I said, uh, I didn't say it. Uh, uh, uh. You mentioned that everything is like, you can finish things for half credit, not even just not sure. No, that's not what I'm looking for. That's what I forgot on Thursday. Uh, oh, it's not on these slides. Okay. Uh, no, we. I think it just came up. So curving, uh, the syllabus does mention that in the event everyone, you know, the class as a whole doesn't perform very well, uh, we reserve the opportunity, you know, to, to curve, lift everyone's grade up. I'm gonna tell you right now that me as an instructor, I don't believe in that, okay? Your grade is your grade. If for whatever reason we like run into a brick wall on this, we'll deal with that next week. Whether we extend a deadline, whether we overlap something, uh, whether we add some extra credit, whether we reduce, however we deal with it, we'll deal with it there and now. It will not be an end of the semester bailout. All right. Uh, the logic there is twofold. One, you always know how you're doing in the class. And two, people that are struggling, you know you're struggling. Don't ride the struggle bus <coughs> until the end of the semester thinking there's going to be some great curve. All right. Uh, it's, it's just not going to happen. Uh, you can ask anyone that's taken a, a security course with me. I, I don't care. Uh, but hopefully you get why. It's not as a, as a be mean thing. It's just, I think that's a good way of functioning as a class. All right, with that, I've reached the, the end here. Uh, we are roughly on time. So this is uh, what my slides will always end with. I said, I'll, you'll get about five slides from me. The last one will be something like this. This says demo plans time permitting. And I'll list a couple things that I, I intend on talking about uh, and demoing. 
Before that, does anyone have any questions? Good. What do we got? Will the VODs be available after the streams? Yes. The question is, will the Twitch VODs be available after streams? And the answer is, as soon as I hit stop, it's available as a Twitch VOD. Uh, as far as timeline to getting it up on YouTube, uh, give me a day or so. I'm the one that port, ports the channel or ports the videos. And it's just kind of a when I have time, but I try and get to it within 24, 48 hours. But the VODs are available immediately. Uh, right here. Is there a, a Canvas component at all? Is there a Canvas component? Uh, so I know some other phone call related classes are exploring Canvas. I am not a fan of Canvas. I will not be using Canvas. I will not be syncing grades to Canvas. I will do zero communication on Canvas. Everything is Pwn College Discord, or if you really feel like it, shoot me an email. I don't think there's even a show for your class on Canvas. That's yeah, by yeah. design. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that's why you show up for day one. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I do have one question. I think I asked this at the end of last class on Thursday, or the last time I was here on Thursday. Uh, I did want to ask, I think, for people who are also in Tuesday's class. What is the ruling on generative AI, the use of generative AI, at least okay. the one provided by Phone College, and then also on third-party services like ChatGPT and stuff like that? Okay, so the question for Twitch here is, uh, how do we feel about generative AI? Uh, so I do want to demo at least a couple things on Phone College, uh, but real quick here, uh, if... The chat thing, I think. Yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the... No, well, we'll get there, we'll get there. I, I, I get where you're going. Uh, so on Pwn College, uh, if you start some random challenge here, I have no idea what it is. I just pick something. Uh, once it says here it's started up, uh, you can uh, click this little help icon and it's going to drop you into uh, a little chat box. How do I solve this? Right. Uh, it is a generative AI backed um, kind of instructor uh, meant to kind of backstop you. I do not have a problem if you use generative AI, right? I, all right, I have no idea what it said, right? That's what happens when you run the LLMs. Uh, it actually didn't give horrible advice. Identify the challenge binary, it tells you where it is, it tells you some things you could run on it, try and figure out what's going on. Why would you want to use this over general chat GPT, Claude, whatever else is out there? Uh, so we provide this at no cost to you, we eat it. Uh, and this should provide a better experience than any of the um, you know, commercial uh, ones. Obviously, this is backed by a commercial LLM. Uh, the reason for that is this has access uh, to your terminal. I haven't typed anything in the terminal, so it has nothing to go off of. But if I was working on something and typing things in my terminal, uh, that gets fed into the context window uh, so that the LLM has some idea of what it is you've tried, and it can hopefully guide you on where your mistake is. Additionally, if you're working on a file, it gets access to whatever the most recent file is that you've been working on. So if I'm writing some exploit script, it has an idea of what it is you're doing. Uh, so you can say, hey, you made a typo on line six or whatever the LLM says. So I, I do just want to ask, with, I understand that you're good with us using uh, generative AI. Are you okay with us using code suggested by the generative AI in our solutions? Is there a penalty for that or how, how does that work? So the question is, is there a penalty if I use generative AI? Uh, it'll go like this. If you use this, you I don't care if it tells you exactly and you copy and paste it. If you spend your time trying to get this thing to solve these, all right, you put in the time for your point. Okay. All right, uh, and, and the, the, reason, the reason I say that is, LLMs are good at simple tasks. LLMs are horrible at anything that is like mediocrely complex. And while like right now in CSE 365, people are loving Sense AI, they're also doing like, how do I cat a file? All right. It, it turns out that that's a pretty common thing uh, that LLMs have been trained on. So yes, it's very good at telling you like uh, how to open up a file in a terminal. Uh, but, but when it's like, here is an arbitrary binary, and I need to figure out what input is necessary to cause some effect or escalate privileges, it turns out LLMs are not very good at that. Uh, they are decent at providing conceptual advice, high-level things like here, it suggested some tools, some high-level things to think about and try, right? Use it to your heart's content. If you happen to pull some verbatim code that this you make this thing produce, we have logs of all of this. Like, if it becomes an issue, it's very easily easy to sort out. Now, on the flip side here, 
Uh, you asked about third-party LLMs. The answer there is I personally do not care. However, as I mentioned, the cloud is just somebody else's machine, and in this case, it's our machine. We are going to put forth you know, a non-zero amount of effort to detect cheating. How we do so, obviously it wouldn't be quite right if I told you. If you have worries that what your LLM output is what everyone else is going to type as well, maybe don't use that. <laughs> All right? No, no, but I, I, like, I, no, 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 but I, I just want to be clear. I legitimately do not care what tool you use, how you do it. Right? At so the end of the AI, no repercussion. You, third party LLM, some repercussion. Yeah. Third party yeah. LLM, you could, uh, you could end up wrapped up in a mess. That's perfectly fine. Right. I was uh, wondering about that. Yeah, the, the, this, this one, if, if everyone manages to get this thing to produce the exact same verbatim code in the class, if everyone submits it, I would have a log of everyone's interaction of every single one of those people getting that exact same code. And then it's okay, that's on us. My bad. Good for you. Okay. All right. That's but when, when, when you start, regurgitating code from the netherworld and everyone shows up with the exact same thing, I have to be like, ah, wait a minute, man. No, yeah, I understand right. that. I just right. want to understand about it. Sure. Yeah, the, this is, is fair game. Have at it. Fantastic. Yes, question. I a number for like the hours of the weekly workload. Okay, uh, good question. Good, very good, very good. Uh, I brought it up on Thursday, didn't touch it today. Uh, so what is like the rough workload? How much time is this class going to demand of you? Depends on how familiar you are with the material and how clever you are, like how much you're trying to achieve, right? Uh, if you're trying to 100% everything on this course, I do not think it is unrealistic to say 30, 40 hours a week, okay? Uh, if you're trying to just pass this course, maybe half that, right? And I'm, I'm assuming that you're generally competent as far as prereqs are concerned. Like, I know how to use GDP, I'm comfortable in a terminal, I have an idea of what's going on, um, et cetera. But no, this, this is an extremely demanding class, which is why I have that, that first slide. And when you uh, get this assignment here in 30 minutes, uh, when that goes live, you'll see and be able to get a feel for what are we doing, right? Um, and what, what the curve is, as far as the difficulty progression. Uh, but there absolutely are students who put in 60 hours a week in this course and don't complete everything. All right. All right. It, that that's that's just the name of the game. Yes. It's kind of lost set of three six five. Um, is GDB and other tools like that? Is that part of the the like phone college or is it like a separate tool? Uh, the question is, what is GDB? Uh, is that part of phone college? Is that a separate tool? It's not a good sign if you're asking that question. I um, think it's part of the Linux thing. Uh, so, so GDB is the, the GNU debugger, uh, which is kind of the de facto debugging uh, for any Unix platform. So if you've done any debugging at a, at a low level, you would be using GDB. Uh, I will use GDB almost every single day in class. It is my preferred tool for figuring stuff out. There are other tools, and I will try and cover other approaches if it you know, is something that works better for other people. But my personal workflow relies to an insane degree on GDB. Uh, so I started up some uh, some challenge, right? I'm going to SSH into the dojo, which is my preferred way of working. I live in the terminal, just in general, not specific to this course. Okay, this is a reverse engineering challenge. Uh, it is a binary, I started it out with GDB. Now I have a plugin with GDB that shows me Jeff, uh, which is something we can certainly talk about. I have now started the challenge in GDB. I'm gonna hit Control C, because right now it's waiting on input. This is going to send sig int. Sig int is gonna interrupt uh, the program and drop me into GDB's interface. Now there's a lot of stuff going on here. Uh, you may not have seen this before, uh, but you should be familiar with, uh, for instance, uh, this right here, these are registers of a CPU. These are the values that are in them. They're 64 bit. This is a pointer. This is pointing to somewhere in memory and the value that is located there. Uh, these here are the flags uh, that are the state of the flag registers, which are used if you're going to do a comparison or a comparative jump, right? Comparison that gets set, a comparative jump reads those values to determine where we are. Turns out we happen to be at a compare instruction. Uh, so that may or may not be relevant. 
uh, this right here is a, is a sneak peek of kind of what's going on on the stack. All right, so this is where RSP is. RSP points right here. And then as we uh, move up numerically, we move down in this graphic. Uh, these are additional values that happen to be located on the stack. Uh, this is RBP, uh, which is the base pointer. Additionally, this right here is a backtrace. Uh, a backtrace is going to be the series of calls that got me to where I am. This particular challenge is probably not the best one. Eh, that's not too bad. Okay, so this uh, is libc start main, which is the thing that loads main, like your program start with main when you write something in C, right? It turns out there's something that runs before that, uh, and that eventually calls libc start main, which is takes the pointer to main. Uh, this frame right here is main. Main is calling read. I am inside of read at this compare instruction, blocking on input. Hopefully, I don't expect you to know literally everything I just said, but most of those words should mean something. If they don't, I'm more than happy to like try and fill the gap here, right? Uh, but those words should mean something. Like when I say this is the stack, this is the heap, this is a backtrace, what is a stack frame, what are registers? Uh, that, that, that is kind of the, the knowledge expectation here uh, that I'm gonna be functioning under. Uh, I can step through. It's now waiting on my input. I give it something, GDB uh, goes to the next instruction. I was on the compare that's black, you can't see. I'm on the next instruction uh, right there, SI step instruction. I moved one assembly instruction forward. Uh, so th this is what I mean when I say like be comfortable with GDB, right? You don't have to be a master of it. We'll pick it up as we go, but it shouldn't be your first time touching it. Uh, in other words, is it fine if we have Mac or do we need some tool in Windows? Do I need a Mac? Well, it turns out, uh, or do I need Linux or Windows? Or it turns out I'm on a Mac. Uh, we just saw me pull this all off uh, on a Mac. So I think you're okay on a Mac. Uh, if you don't like SSH, the terminal is scary. That's a-okay too. Uh, so there are additional things here, workspace and desktop. Uh, so if you like VS code, once this loads, this will be a full VS code interface in your browser. This is sitting in that same challenge environment. So if I'm like, hey, I like VS code to work on my stuff, uh, you can do that uh, right uh, here as well. I don't know how to use VS code. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I live in the terminal, all right? No, nobody's, uh, nobody's perfect. Uh, but yeah, you can edit files here. This is all being saved on the challenge environment. So if VS code is your thing, that's great. Somewhere in VS Code, you can hit a button and make the terminal pop up. I did it on Thursday, but I don't know what it is. And if for whatever reason VS Code is also scary for you, and you're like, hey, I like you know Windows, I like a GUI, and some things need a GUI, so like there is a reason that this exists, uh, you can get a full Linux desktop uh, right here in your web browser. This is also interacting with that same challenge environment. You don't have to open up terminals, but it's certainly relevant if we're going to open up a tool that has a GUI. Uh, for instance, this is a static uh, decompiler. Uh, known as Ida, and maybe I need to open up this challenge for whatever this is. This is actually something from CSE 365, uh, and I need to decompile this and then work in this tool if, if I need this for whatever reason to, to help me address what I'm trying to solve. Yeah, that, that it is, you know, that's why there's the beauty of the terminal. <laughs> All right, uh, so, so you aren't restricted to this. You don't have to use GDB. I'm going to tell you that GDB would save you a ton of time. Uh, you can use a Mac, you can use Windows, you can do connect via any of the three ways that you just saw on any platform. I don't know about like whatever Google's thing is. Um, I'm gonna go back there because you've been there for a while. What do you got? Yeah. Cool. Uh, question was for the meme extra credit, it's 0.5 per meme per week. Uh, when does that week reset? Uh, so the code that we use actually does a seven day shifting window, right? So I just pick whatever seven day selection happens to work best for every student, right? It's not like, oh, it resets on Sunday, hit me on Monday. Just post a meme once a week, you'll get the credit. Uh, yes, up front. Um, if we find ourselves like, going through the challenges and, and kind of like struggling with some of the, like just like feeling rusty on like GDB or some of the prereqs, 
what do you recommend like going back and doing old challenges or are there certain tools that you think like getting refreshers on is good for? Cool. Uh, question was, hey, if I start working on this and I'm like, man, I don't remember GDB. I used it. The class was forever ago. Uh, what should I do to catch up? Uh, GDB in particular, I'm not the biggest fan of this uh, and I recorded it. <laughs> uh, this was actually my first uh, video on phone college. You don't even get to see, see my face. Um, it's, it's just me and GDB, but it, it's quite long. Uh, but I do go through basically everything that you would reasonably need uh, to function within GDB. Um, there are also a series of challenges here under optional refresher. It doesn't cover and test everything, uh, but it gives you the opportunity to kind of play around with it um, and get going there. Uh, on the topic of that, how many people are familiar with GDB? Okay, so most people. Okay, I was, I was gonna say, if not, I can do some YOLO stream tomorrow at some point that I can announce uh, where we can like run through some of this uh, if people would like that. Um, just to I'm gonna get a couple thumbs up. All right, uh, I'll announce that on the Discord once I figure out what time works. Uh, I'll do some YOLO stream and we'll just talk about whatever it is you got. So I've got seven more minutes. I'm gonna take one more question then I'm gonna show what you have to do like right away. Yes. Sweet. Uh, that is exactly what I have to show you to make sure that, uh, you know, you know what to do before we walk out of here. The question was, how do I get set up? How does this all work? So uh, if we open up phone college, uh, you get this nice register thing, uh, mash register, sign up, make up a username, does not have to be, uh, that's an Evernote email. I don't even you want, if you want to spam something to an old email, Evernote account, have at it. Um, uh, make up a username. It does not have to be related to your student ID, your name, your course. I don't care, right? Just make it not accessibly for a name. Uh, email. doesn't have to be your ASU email. Just an email. Uh, the only reason we collect it is so that if you forget your password, which happens an embarrassingly large amount of times, uh, we can uh, get that sorted out. Uh, once you've done that, you'll be logged in, which just means that this looks like this. To get this synced up so that I know you are an ASU student, what you need to do is scroll down. For you, it'll be under the courses. Sweet, it is the courses for me. Uh, CSE Fall 2024. You're going to click on Course. Now, this is going to bring up the syllabus, uh, which should cover pretty much everything that I already said, but it's there. Uh, the important thing is this bottom one here that says Setup. We click Setup. Someone was really nice and they made it really easy. There's five things, there's five links, there's five X's or check marks. X's are bad, check marks are good. All right, you get five green check marks on this page. You are synced up with the class, you are in the Discord, you'll have the ASU 466 Fall 2024 Discord role, uh, which will give you access to course specific uh, Discord channels. It's where I'll do the announcements and if for whatever reason we need to have communication about uh, how the class is running, or something that isn't going to be public uh, on the public Discord, uh, we can have it there. Uh, it also will let you uh, sync up your ASU student ID. Uh, that way at the end of the semester, when ASU says, hey, what grade did this person get? Uh, I can easily uh, yoink it out uh, and send it to ASU. All right. So again, that was from the Dojos page, uh, ASU 466 Fall 2024, click the courses button. And then on the left-hand side here, we click Setup. You get a series of five instructions, which I think boil down to clicking five links. That gets you configured and good to go. In 20 minutes, uh, when we go to Dojo's Fall 2024, uh, you will see program security. All right. Uh, right now, there are the prior iteration. There's, there's a bajillion lectures. Right, because I included the stuff from uh, that was included for binary exploitation CSE 365 because I didn't know what people know. Uh, the ones that are immediately relevant are like memory corruption, ASLR, canaries. There's there's like three videos that are actually should be new content uh, if you took ASU 365. But there's a bunch on there. Uh, later tonight, I'm going to be recording my take on these. Uh, my goal with kind of re-recording uh, the topical content is to not hit you with three hours of lecture videos before you get going. Uh, my target for a lecture video is like 10, 15 minutes. But that means I'm going to go fast, which means you're going to pause. 
all right? Uh, but I'd rather do that than hit you with three hours of videos and expect you to go through that before you get going. All right, uh, with that, uh, no, I do have four minutes. I got four minutes. Uh, yes. Um, so on the topic, <coughs> sorry, of the lectures, how, mm -hmm. how many percentage would you say like the lecture actually translates into like, challenges? As in, like, do I get, how many percentage do I need to research on my own? Okay, a uh, question for Twitch uh, was uh, the lecture videos. How relevant are they to what I'm actually doing, right? Um, the, the answer is they're, they're extremely relevant. Um, they're relevant topically. They are not going to mirror what you will literally do in the challenge. And what I mean when I say that is there are some courses where the way that the course runs is the instructor says, I'm going to type A, B, C, and then I'm going to put this in box D, and then this happens. Here's your challenge, or here's your assignment. What do you do? I type A, B, C, I put something in box D, I hit go, and the exact same thing happens. That is not how this course works. Uh, the lecture videos will tell you all of the information you need to solve the challenge, all of the conceptual understanding that you need. However, it is up to you to apply it, right? Uh, a good example uh, would be like the, Part of the program exploitation is uh, shell coding under constraints. So this is maybe something like, okay, I need you to write shell code and it needs to, I don't think this is actually one of them, but hypothetically I could say write alphanumeric shell code. I assume that you know how to write assembly. Shell code is literally just writing assembly and throwing it in there. Your requirement is write shell code that is all letters and numbers, right? That is printable stuff. How do you do that? Well, it's up to you, figure, figure it out, right? Uh, like you should have some idea of how assembly instructions work. Now, I do not, uh, just to give you a sneak peek as far as like what I'm gonna be recording tonight. Um, is it this one? Yeah, uh, so the, the, these slides right here, how do I build chill code? Well, you could do it with the assembler tool. You can do it there, that's great. It's a low level understanding. Right? It's good to do once or twice and then it sucks. Uh, you can do it with GCC, which is going to call those same things under the hood. And you can do that and I'll show it and I'll give you a live demo and you can do that. And that's great. It's a big, pretty big improvement. Uh, but that is also time consuming and kind of sucks. Uh, or you could learn Python and Pwn tools. And I'm going to show this as well. And the reason you may want to do something like this is now I can programmatically access that byte string. I can print it out and display it. I can rapidly iterate on what I'm doing. Now, am I telling you how to write alphanumeric shellcode? No, but I am providing a framework of the tools that you can use to problem solve your way through it. All right. Uh, in general, I try and structure lecture content that I uh, do in the same order that you will likely encounter it in challenge progression. Uh, there's not a guarantee there, uh, but that is kind of the goal as far as uh, how I design things. Uh, question, one minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes when we're using debugger tools like IDA, um, the trap to the site will be very high and sometimes it'll crash, oftentimes like very close to the deadline. Mm -hmm. Is there any infrastructure to deal with that issue? Okay, question was the dojo in general. I have too many tabs up here. Nice. Uh, I did list the memes from this earlier this week. All right, sometimes the dojo catches fire, particularly when people are doing uh, lots of reverse engineering or they're using IDA. IDA in particular, that actually isn't us. Um, IDA free um, has a limitation on their server. Okay. Uh, and so that actually is IDA telling everyone on the planet that they can't uh, decompile anything, uh, not just us. As far as the dojo itself, uh, you are not wrong in saying that mere deadlines, because students procrastinate despite everything that we try and do to prevent it. Uh, the day of a deadline Students will swarm the server and write infinite loops and, and fork bomb themselves and do absolutely ridiculous things. Sometimes that makes it very difficult for those of you that um, are trying to get something done at the last minute. We are making improvements there. Um, part of like what happened over the past week with 365 is related to some of those improvements. It turns out when you change things, sometimes they break, right? Uh, you don't get it right on the first time. You, you can't load test until you have a load. Um, we do have additional things that hopefully will be done um, in the next week or so um, that should heavily um, address that problem. But that is a general problem, right? Um, 
if it's something utterly ridiculous, I'll give you an extra day. We'll try and sort it out. Uh, the problem with giving everyone an extra day is everyone just does the same thing the next day. So it actually doesn't solve the problem. It just repeats it. Uh, but you're, you're not wrong. And that is something that everyone should be aware of, right? Uh, facts. And anything else? Uh, at this point, I'm past past time. So if you want to walk out of here, have at it. But I'll answer questions as well. What was Jeff? Uh, what was Jeff was the question. So... Uh, are you familiar with what a... Oh, man. You, you just... Did I? You, you crushed the camera. My bad. I might, uh, I might be a little tall. Oh, no, no. It's, it's all right. It's just it's going to cause me some grief. Sorry. Uh, okay. So uh, the question was, what is Jeff? I'm still streaming, just FYI. The camera didn't stop. Uh, do you know what a GDB init is? No. Cool. Uh, so .gdb init is a file, you text file you can create in your home directory. This is something that gets loaded every time you start GDB. So you can put whatever commands you want in there, uh, and they will run. Jeff, we see here, I'm sourcing opt Jeff, Jeff.py. Uh, this is a Python plugin to GDB. So I showed all of that fancy stuff, and I was like, oh, you should know what this is, right? I'm running this challenge. If I don't have Jeff, this is what we, this is what we get. Right, uh, and so Jeff is a great way to just have information you probably want to see anyways, uh, thrown right in front of your face. Uh, setting it up, using it is definitely in the GDB video. Are there any big classroom questions before I turn off the stream? Because I see the the queue here for me yeah. individually. Okay, with that, give me one second. We're gonna kill the queue. We're kill the stream.